Well, uh, today's uh, going to be our first uh, online lecture discussion and uh, of the semester for our hybrid class. We're going to be dealing with Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative and my purpose in providing this two video series here is just to kind of get the ball kick down the field a little bit and get us started a little bit with this uh, particular selection. It's not a terribly lengthy selection. It is a couple hundred years old, so it's a little kind of hard to read. Once you get into it, though, you kind of get into the rhythm of the language being a little antiquated, and you kind of uh, pick it up pretty quickly. I'm going to give you a little background information, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the themes, some of the problematic aspects of it, and then some of the issues in the text in the next video that accompanies this one uh, to get us started uh, in get us ready for our online uh, discussion threads uh, on Blackboard. Uh, also at the end of the second video you'll find the quiz questions and some instructions on how to submit those. But let's begin just with a brief history, a little overview. We're not going to do a, an American history class here. We're just going to talk a little bit about the fact that we talked about um, the Puritans and uh, how they came over in the 1630s primarily. Um, and up in your upper right hand corner there you'll see a map that kind of uh, diagrams King Philip's War. You can go and look all of that up if you're really interested in the history behind it, but you kind of do need to know that um, we're talking about the, 17, the 1670s here, and by that time, four decades after the Great Migration began, you had quite a few uh, Puritan and other religions, um, settlers in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and in Rhode Island, Connecticut, and these areas. In fact, what was going on was people were moving in there faster than uh, they were able to settle in the cities. And, and once you get into a place like Boston and it gets a fairly good sized uh, population and it's a pretty good sized town with a few thousand people in it, most people who came there were farmers. They were looking for farmland. That is another big impetus. It wasn't just about religion. It was about the, the inavailability, the unavailability, of, I should say, of, of farmland. Um, the population in England was growing quite substantially, and what do you do? I mean, you have eight or ten kids, and even if four or five of them survive, uh, the males have to go do something for a living. Some can be apprenticed, yes. Some, if you've got money, could be educated and go into professions like law or medicine or the clergy. But a lot of them were basically farmers, and uh, you can't just keep taking the old homestead and dividing it into ever smaller bits and pieces. And so the population expanding in England, and especially with the consolidation of uh, open areas of land and grazing on the part of the aristocracy, there's a real need on the part of the population there for farmland. So they're moving there, and what's happening is uh, towns like Boston are growing and everything, but as people have children, those children are pushing ever westward, right? This is, you know, something everybody ought to know if you take an American history class. They're moving westward in Massachusetts. What does that mean? That means that a lot of the people were living in very small outlying towns. Those towns, as you can see on the, on the map there, Sudbury, Lancaster, these kinds of places, um, were pretty far away from Boston. Doesn't look like it on the map, but it was actually pretty far away. If you were on horseback or walking, and we're not talking roads here, we're talking paths. Um, that were pretty rocky and woodsy and fairly dangerous. Um, this took you quite a while. It took you a couple, three days to get from Lancaster to, to Boston or maybe more in bad weather. So we're talking about people who lived in terms of not, you know, miles, but in terms of hours, fairly isolated out there on the frontier. And, um, you know, I, 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 we won't go into all the specifics about King Philip's War. Just, you know, suffice it to say that, that uh, at, at a certain point, there came uh, some Native American resistance to this migration. It certainly came well, too late. Um, um, and uh, King Philip uh, and his, uh, his uh, uh, warriors ended up losing that war to the, uh, to the colonists. But it was one that waged for some time, uh, many months, and uh, over a fairly ro uh, broad range. Um, and essentially it, what, it, what it eventually led to was a very steep decline in the Native American population in that area, um, the exile of a lot of Native Americans, and a pretty decisive victory on the part of the English colonists. That being the backdrop, uh, we go in here and take a look at Mary Rowlandson, who, you know, as she says in the, at the outset, this really was a text that was written for herself, or at least she says so, um, not for public consumption, but only afterwards was, uh, uh, they decided to, to, uh, to uh, publish it. Sound familiar? Uh, this is written by her own hand for her private use and now made public at the earnest desire of some friends. That is an important thing. I don't 
necessarily doubt her desire to write all this down and without the thought of publication at first. There's no sense that she made a lot of money off of it, although it was a wildly popular text, not just in America, but also in England. The other thing to remember is that most texts that were written in America and that were published were pretty much published for English consumption, not necessarily colonial consumption. The marketplace wasn't very big. You really would write a book and you would publish it back in England. And imagine the appetite back in London for tales of this wilderness frontier with these exotic Native Americans doing all kinds of shocking and savage things uh, to, the, in, to their mind. Um, and uh, so you, you'll readily see that there was an enormous amount of appeal. So I don't doubt that some people thought, well, this is important to, to share, but Many other people thought, well, people back in, in, in England will really want to hear this. It could very well be that this is a bit of a propaganda piece. I want you to bear that in mind, that, that you know, after the English Civil War, after um, the Puritans were sort of tossed out or tossed themselves out, Cromwell's dead, the restoration of the crown, Puritanism is kind of old hat by then. It could be that some people in the colonies felt that a, that a narrative that truly and accurately and violently depicts the hardships of the colonists might win them some sympathy with people back in the old country. Um, that's entirely speculation, but it's an interesting possibility. So she may not have wanted to publish it, and others may have thought, no, we really should. Um, she was a Puritan, the wife of a prominent pastor, as your head note says. And the other thing I want you to bear in mind is that this is really kind of a brand new genre. Fiction had, had, had not really been invented yet. People argue about what the first novel was. first novel was probably either uh, Robinson Crusoe or Pamela or something like that. I mean, the very, very, very first novels were starting at the end of the 1600s in England. And what preceded them were supposed true stories. Robinson Crusoe was, a, was based on, loosely, on a true story. Moll Flanders was based loosely on a supposedly true story. Uh, Pamela as well. And so what was happening is these narratives or autobiographies or true life, uh, you know, sensational stories eventually got fictionalized and made into novels. But So what you're looking at is something that wasn't fiction, we don't think at all, but it was the kind of stuff that was starting to sort of capture the imagination of readers in cities like London or Paris or Madrid or whatever. And um, eventually, someone would get the bright idea that, well, you know what, let's play fast and loose with the facts and just make one up from whole cloth and see what happens. And that's where the novel comes from. Okay, so some themes that we want to make sure that we look at here. Um, as a Puritan, she would have had a very strong belief in God's providence. That makes this very interesting, doesn't it? Because she went through a great deal of hardship. There's no evidence in her mind, and nothing that we know of, that would merit her treatment in this manner. She is, in many respects, almost Job-like. If you know the story of Job in the Old Testament, who undergoes all these different hardships, and the big question is, well, why? Why am I being subjected to this? I'm a, I'm a good person. I've, I, 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 I believe in God. I, I, I keep the commandments. I do all these good things. And, yet I, and so Job is this biblical story of why do bad things happen to good people? And that's, of course, a, an ethical dilemma we all have to deal with today. We see it in, you know, just turn on the news every night, and you say that that's a terrible thing to happen to somebody who is such a nice person. And so that's one of the great enigmas of the human experience is why do bad things happen to good people? And she lives it. She has to live it in this text. Um, she explicates or th this whole experience. All these removes are just relocation. So hopefully by the time you got to like the 20th remove, you figured out, wow, okay, so they're picking up and moving every time. So that's what they mean. Um, um, and it's this long trek through the different places and the different wilderness areas uh, because the Native Americans are kind of constantly on the run from the English who are trying to come and capture them or kill them and get their get their English captives back. So they're they're hot footing it through the through the woods and the briars and brambles to to, to hang on to their hostages. Why would they want the hostages? That's a good question. Um, they kept them obviously for ransom. You see that at the end of this whole thing. Um, but they might also want them to trade uh, as slaves. Um, clearly, Rowlandson is a valuable commodity because of, she's a seamstress. And that is a great skill 
Um, you and I think, oh, well, we just buy our clothes off the rack. What's the big deal? But let me tell you something. Before the invention of electric uh, sewing machines and whatnot, to be a seamstress, to, to be good at sewing, it was a very difficult thing to do. You had to, you had to practice many years. A woman who had that kind of talent could make good money and was in very high demand. And so these Native Americans realized real quickly, and she knows it, realize really quickly that she is a valuable commodity. She knows it, and she lets them know, I'm good at this. You don't want to kill me. You don't want to get rid of me. So if you wonder why in the world they hung on to her, it's because of her, basically her talent in that respect. In fact, her talent was so great that if she wanted to, she knew they wouldn't kill her right off the bat. I mean, they threatened it. But she knew that, that she actually had the ability to get paid for the work because, um, you know, what are they going to do? You're going to kill me or you're going to pay me? If you pay me, then, you know, I work pretty cheaply because I'm starving here. Um, you kill me and you got nothing, pal. So, in a way, that is a really big power implement tool on her part, right? So she's able to use that as a bargaining chip that's pretty heavy duty and she knows it. So they can mistreat her and they can do all these horrible things, but at the end of the day, yeah, there's a point at which they won't go beyond because they know that they don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg in that respect. But in terms of providence, you see her constantly referring to biblical passages. Look carefully at how many of those passages deal with hardship and trial and travail and whatnot. And she obviously uses this in order to try to come to terms with what's happening to her. We'll talk about that a little bit in the next video as well. The second theme is the survival instinct, and that is the extent to which people will go in order to stay alive. And that's a huge thing. She says at the outset, I always told myself I would never be taken alive. I would just go ahead and die. But you know what? When it came down to it, even in the midst of all this carnage, even though they had killed my children, the survival instinct is so strong that it's really hard not to, to want to stay alive. Um, and you got to get to a really bad point. She said, I never really kind of got to that point. I always wanted to survive. Now, those are two really important themes. Survival in the face of incredible hardship and then God's providence versus all these difficult things. Because if you believe in a God that that protects his believers and his children, his, you know, the Puritans believe this, obviously, and who's in control of everything, then she's constantly faced with this question of why would God let this happen to me? Why would God let this happen to innocent children? And those two things, survival against all those hardships and, and providence and, and, and why, why do we suffer? Those are just kind of eternal themes. We see this in lots of literature all over the world, different nationalities, different time periods. It's kind of, these are two of the big eternal questions. So that's one of the reasons why this is so, so often uh, read. Some problematic aspects. This is the issue. Why would people be so evil? Why would people do such harm? Why are people so violent? She obviously sees it through the eyes of an English settler. Um, I'm sure the Native Americans probably wondered why these English people were being so unkind to them. But the nature of evil and its source, what inspires them to do it? And the thing that she doesn't address as directly, but it's clearly there under the surface is, why do human beings, not just Native Americans, why do human beings at all seem to get pleasure from violence and inflicting pain and abuse on others. What makes us do that, right? Other animals don't seem to like to do that. Okay, I'm, uh, a cat likes to play with a mouse, but it's actually practice for hunting. But human beings like to see suffering, at least some of them do. What is that? Where does that come from? The culture clash that's so apparent. Their values versus her values and they're extremely stark and different. The treatment of women, the treatment of children, the acts of barbarity in her eyes, the uh, the relative lack of value for non-Native American life. But what you sometimes don't see, I think she has a glimmer of enlightenment here, but not fully, is you can see, as a modern person reading this, that undoubtedly both cultures totally underestimated and miss represented each other. That guy over there is the savage. That guy over there is the one that's a barbaric. That guy over there. And there was an enormous 
lack of understanding about the two different cultures and their value systems that you see there, that serious uh, clash there. The other problematic aspect is there's no question that she had to reconcile what happened to her with her own belief in God and why this was allowed to happen. And she maintains her faith, but as we'll see in the next uh, video, uh, the second of this two-part series, uh, there are several issues that come up within the text or episodes in the text where you have to pause and say, you know what, she may have started this traumatic experience as a fairly believing and trusting and naive and obedient wife, but by the end, there are glimmers and glimpses within the text that she's questioning a lot of things. Not necessarily her faith, but she's questioning a lot of things that, 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 um, her society and her civilization um, uh, are, are certainly take as being implicit. Okay, so uh, go on and click over to the next video and um, then we'll continue this.